said, I got my knife, preacher. And I said, well, what are we going to do with it? I said, I kill snakes with mine. He said, will you teach me to kill snakes? Five years old. I went and told his mom, the bride-to-be. I said, you got a little snake killer right there. He wants to get, oh, yeah, he, he got to wear his knife now. He's, he's sharp with that. And he was going to, <laughs> he going to show me how fast he can pull it out. I said, no, leave it alone. <laughs> it's all good. That takes a little practice. Got your Bibles? I'm going to end up in John chapter 19. Before I get there, you'll see a few scriptures on the overhead. John 19. Matter of fact, let's go ahead and start there, Mike, if you would, in John 19. We've been talking about his last words, and we, we're moving up through Scripture, and we, we dealt with a couple. We'll, we'll repeat them in just a minute. But the last words are so important. These words to me are the most precious. These have to do with his, the commission that he gave his brother. Are you comfortable? Luke 19, verse 25, near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, being his aunt, Mary, the wife of Clophus, Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene, this is not Martha's sister. Mary Magdalene was a prostitute who also washed his feet with her hair. Mary's a, she's a lady that, that kind of, it's almost like the same scene again with Mary and Martha, but a little different story. She's a woman that had deep appreciation. This is where we learn from much is forgiven, much is loved. When you've been forgiven much, you love much. It, it's your meter. Once you realize how, how you've been in life and how much that God has forgiven you for things maybe have never been discovered, when you realize that, you realize how much you ought to love him. And how that ought to reciprocate back to him. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, woman, here is your son. Again, he's not able, he's not talking about himself. To the disciple, John, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Uh, I find it uh, fascinating that every one of us have such different personalities. And when you study the disciples, their theology, all, all of them have different theologies. Just take Peter, James, and John. John, of course, is the one that always said that uh, Jesus loved him. When you're always saying somebody else loves you, uh, you may have a little insecurity. But uh, John was always saying it. You know, I'm the one that Jesus loved. I'm the one. So when you read his gospels, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, it's the gospel of love. He's always talking about love. No greater love than this. Love, uh, you know, you, you know your, your, uh, your brothers because of love one toward another. You know, he's always talking about love. When you talk about James, when you read James's theology, James is stern, hard. Show me your faith by your works. I want to see some action. So his theology was connected to his personality. Well, Peter, when you see Peter presumptuous, uh, going after it, but always one word I see in Peter's life, forgiveness. Over and over, forgiveness. How many times I had to forgive John? How many times I got to deal with this? Then he goes through a time of denying Christ three times, and then forgiveness was granted him. Your personality often dictates to what kind of theology you lean toward. You know, there's certain people have a real stern black and white view of life, very prophetic, anointing, uh, anointing on them. They just want to see things that way, and they're, they kind of get, get after you. Well, yeah, that's got a lot to do with their personality. So I would say to you who have that personality, cut some slack to the rest of us who all also have a different personality because there's other people in life that see life a little bit more grayer than black and white oh you ain't got to amen me i'm good with me amen so tonight this morning i want to talk to you about his last words the final words of family man and jesus was a family man he loved his mother he loved his brothers and sisters father i love you i thank you for your word your anointing god just let it rest here let our ears be open to hear let us grasp the word of god let it change and affect our lives in jesus name and everyone said amen, amen. god bless you you may be seated we started with he, with what he said and there were two things that happened on the way to calvary just in in retrospect, we'll look back to Via Della Rosa, the way of sorrow. Another carried his cross. We understand that as they led him away. They see Simon from Cyrene who was on his way from the country and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. It had been a long night, lack of sleep, trials, mockery, loss of blood in the garden, scourging. 
he was been beat, his beard had been plucked, Simon had been summoned to carry the cross. Again, in my heart, I believe that uh, they tore the cross from Christ. He, he did not fall carrying his cross. He still was able to handle that. And then he walked across the ladies, the weeping of the women. Luke 23, 27, a large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. Jesus turned and said to them, daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourself. And of course, he was talking about the desolation that was going to come on Jerusalem with, with the Romans of Vespasian and Titus, how they would siege the city, put it under siege, and they starved them out. Uh, we talked about this on Tuesday night and Wednesday night. Uh, we, we just kept bringing it a little bit further in for people to understand some history has already been made. Some prophecies have already been taking place. I remember reading that as a young man, thinking to myself, I don't want to get married. I don't want to have children because, you know, in the last days, this is going to happen. That's going to happen. I don't want to bring my kids up into that. I'm 58 years old. That was 40 years ago, and Jesus still ain't showed up. Can I get an amen? So I, I look at it and I realize a lot of history has already taken place. Over a million, 100,000 Jewish people starved to death in that siege. So it was a, a terrible time. Now we understand a timetable. The seven utterances from the cross, he was crucified at 9 a.m., taken down at 3 p.m., six hours of agony there. The first three utterances demonstrated the love of God. They happened between 9 and 12 o'clock. The first one we talked about last week was the reconciliation. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. This is one of the great statements. You to understand they beat him, they mocked him, they lied about him, and he said, forgive them, forgive them, forgive them. He, he walked out what he believed. He taught us to forgive one another, forgive trespassers as they trespass against you. And yet when he gets to the end of his life, what does he do? He's walking the talk. He's, he's doing exactly what he said he would do. The second thing he said was the conversion of the thief. We talked about it again on Tuesday, Wednesday night. Barabbas was probably with those two thieves. Barabbas gets set free. Of course, Jesus. Jesus takes his place. Barabbas hits the lottery. Uh, one time out of 52 weeks of, uh, of the year of crucifixion, does one man get to go free? It happened to be on Passover. Barabbas gets to walk free. Two men are crucified next to him. One man hurls accusations. If you be the son of cross, get yourself the son of cross, the son of Christ, the son of God. Get yourself off the cross. If you get us down, that's all he thought about was himself. The other one said, we deserve it. Everybody said, we deserve it. We know we deserve. We don't deserve mercy. We don't deserve grace. And yet he gives it to us. Jesus looks at him and says, today thou will be with me in paradise. Today is an important word. There's only two days I know in the word of God. This day and that day. And it's how you live this day that will determine what's going to happen to us on that day. Today is important. Today you'll be with me in paradise. You know, and that's it. That, why is that such important? That tells me that when you leave this earth suit that you're in, you're going to be immediately with him. When Paul said to live as Christ, to die as gain, he meant it. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, he meant it. In other words, today. Everybody shout today. today. That makes me happy. That means I'm not going to be waiting around in a grave or underwater or a crematory or anywhere else. That when I'm done with this suit, this shell, the nut will go home. Amen. It's all going to be over. It's all, so today you'll be with me in paradise. The joy of all of that was magnified in Isaiah 53, prophetic word about him that says, Therefore, I'll reward him extravagantly, the best of everything. Speaking of Christ, God given to Christ the highest honors because he looked death in the face and he didn't flinch. Because he embraced the company of the lowest, he took on his own shoulders the sin of the many. He took up the cause of the black sheep. That's my Jesus. That's my Jesus. He took all the sin for us on his shoulders. He took up the cause of the black sheep. Those of us that are ostracized by either by economy or, or culture or some other way. He said, I got you. I got you. I love you like that. And then he looks at his mama. You talk about a in a sea of hate, there was a drop of love. Mama, oh, I love mama. I know what neck week all about. Hallmark called it Mother's Day. It's Woman's Day, whatever day. But this day is more like Mother's Day to me because I've got it right here. He says, here is your mother. From that time on, his disciple took him into his home. Woman, behold your son. Son, son John. He told us it wasn't James there. It wasn't anyone else there. It was John. 
John the Beloved. John, look at your mother. The last saying here, uh, Jesus gave John custody of his mother, being the oldest son. He relinquished that moment, and this is important. Jesus called the dearest person that he ever knew woman. And, and I'm not trying to uh, be calloused about this, but I believe at that moment Jesus was letting Mary know and the world know you got to come through me to get to dad. Amen. You, you just, you, I, God used you as a woman to get me here. I love you. I love you like that. But there's no need of anything else for you to understand that you are simply Mary at this moment. Uh, that's a hard thing for a son to do. That's a hard thing for anyone to do. To help put somebody in a, in a certain place for them to understand it. But you don't see an offense even in Mary's life. Again, this is the third saying of Christ as he hung there. You know, what families need? Fa you know, of course, families need love. That love, that connection to, to love, to really care. It's amazing what children do. Once you have kids, you don't know what love is till you get a kid. Man, then everything shifts in your life, and there's that love you got for them. And then the grandkids talked to them last night on the phone. My goodness, I know why they're called grand now. You get to give them back. But they're so ready. Uh, as a matter of fact, it, it set the precedent. As soon as I knew when kids camp was, I told Mandy, she said, Dad, when you want the kids? I said, during kids camp. Because I know how much influence that that kids camp going to have on my grandkids. So I want to bring them in at that moment and let them have that time. Families need appreciation. Strong families have the ability to ex express appreciation. Someone once said, home is where family members go when they're tired of being nice to other people. That's home, amen? You got to have a place like that. You got to have communication. A good family's have communication. Jesus didn't have to say nothing on the cross. Then there'd have been a wonderment. Who's going to take care of mama? Who's going to do this? But on the cross, he communicated, John, you take care of mom. Mom, John's got you from this time forward. I'm going to do that. You know, a news program stated the average couple married for over 10 years or longer only communicate about 37 minutes a week. Now, this is not an opportunity for you to pick on your spouse. I'm just saying about 37 seven minutes a week one husband confessed my wife says I don't listen to her at least I think that's what she said <laughs> most relational problems are due to a lack of communication men and women they communicate different you've heard me say this and talk about it a lady once came to the pastor for counseling for divorce she said I want a divorce the pastor said to her do you have any ground she said about nine acres south of town he said no no I mean do you have a grudge she said no but we do have a carport well, he said, does he beat you up? And she said, no, I usually I'm the first one up in the morning. He said, then why are you having trouble with your husband? She said, well, he just doesn't communicate well. You got to learn to communicate. Also, uh, coping skills, learning how to handle life. Strong families see something positive in a crisis and pull together. We think that families that break up have problems and that families that stay together don't. There are those in this room who have kept their families together with bigger problems and some who broke up with little problems. Three things about problems. Every family has problems. Every family. Not every family responds the same way. You know, the, the Chinese symbol for trouble it's also, or for crisis, is also the same word for opportunity. That anytime you have a crisis, you have an opportunity. Your response will either break you or make you. Dennis the Menace, uh, I love Dennis coming up. I know some of you younger people have no idea who Dennis was. But, but in, in one, one cartoon, he's in the corner, he's in trouble again, and he begins to lecture his parents. And he said, if you're raising me right, how come I keep getting into so much trouble? I kind of agree with Dennis there. You got to see positive in a negative situation. Kids who wanted to give their dad a, a family history book, and much to their dismay, one member of the family, Uncle George, was a real black sheep, electrocuted for murder. So they got a creative biography who said, no problem, here's what he wrote about the Uncle George. And again, it's learning how to put positive into the negative. He said of Uncle George, he occupied a chair of applied electronics at an important government institution. He was attached to his position by the strongest of ties, and his death came as a real shock. <laughs> Sometimes you just got to know how to spin it. Can I get an amen? You got to know how to deal with it. Life, lovely as it is, and as wonderful as it's been, it doesn't last forever. 
I have read this scripture so many times this week. I have mulled over it, walked over it, dealt with it, knowing that, that in, in my life, as I, again, it's not the years on my life, it's the miles on my ears and all the things that have gone in. But I read this out of Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse, uh, verse 1 out of the message, and it tells me, and Jesus looking down at his mother, he knew somebody was going to have to take care of her because time is slipping by. And he looked at his brother and said, you've got to take care of her. Honor and enjoy your creator while you're still young. Before the years take their toll and your, uh, your vigor wanes. Before your vision dims and the world blurs and the winter years keep you close to the fire. In old age, your body no longer serves you so well. Muscles slacken, grip weakens, joints stiffen. The shades are pulled down on the world. You can't come and go at, uh, go at will. Things grind to a halt. The hum of the household fades away. You are awakened now by birdsong. Hikes to the mountain. Or a thing of the past. Even a stroll down the road has its terrors. Your hair turns apple blossom white. Adorning a fragile and impotent matchstick body. Yes, you're well on your way to eternal rest. While your friends make plans for your funeral. Life, lovely while it lasts, is soon over. Life as we know it, precious and beautiful, ends. The body is put back into the same ground it came from. The spirit returns to God who first breathed it. Everybody say, thanks for encouraging me today, Pastor. Oh, man, I feel real good about the future. I feel real good about where I'm heading. I'm going to tell you the one word that I see pop, jump out over and over is life, life, life. You've got to live life while you've got life. You've got to enjoy life while you have it. But when you hit certain stages and seasons in your life, you also got to learn how to, to grasp hold of it, understand it. Uh, you know, I, I saw that picture of my daughter get thrown off that horse, and all I thought to myself was, thank God it was my daughter and not me this time. Because I have sure enough been slung off a few horses. Amen. And it takes a long time to get back up and to get back on. Amen. It's important. You know, I spent some time watching my mother. She's really something to think about for me. You know, my mom has reached, well, Lori, was she 75, 76 now? And, and though for some that may not seem old to you, but after she turned there, uh, I, I began to realize how much things had changed. You know, when you're a kid, you never think of your parents growing old. You don't know how old they are, but you think whatever age they are, they'll be that age forever. There's nothing wrong with growing old, but the natural course of life, it's going to happen to all of us if we live long enough. But it's hard to think about your mother or your father growing old. We don't really have a category for that when you're a kid. I remember my mom turned 30. She cried. She cried. She couldn't believe she was that old. She knew at 30 she'd have to get her driver's license soon. True story. We had one car. Dad had it. Mom didn't drive, and then finally she had to get her license. I watched my mom go through, through certain stages. My mom, silver threads now among the gold, apple blossom white. I looked at my mom, and I saw, and I, I'm going to go home in the next few weeks to see her again. And saw the gray hair around her temples, her face etched with the passing of years when she would reach out. Her hands, there was just a little shakiness to it. I watched as she would walk from room to room. My mother has diabetes. She fights muscular dystrophy. She wears braces. Uh, and yet she presses on. She's careful when she walks. I, I asked her, Mom, come to Texas. Come out here and hang out. I can't make that trip no more, son. And then I, I, much as I want to fight her, I just give in. I understand. Mom, I know, I know you've been here before. I'll keep sending pictures. Amen. I'll come home as much as I can. But here, I, you know, I hadn't really noticed my mom doing all that stuff before. I noticed my mom resting on the couch before her feet were hurting. I couldn't remember my mom ever doing that. But she hadn't been in her 70s before. And now she's there. Mom, Mary's older now. The years have passed. Jesus has grown up. She's a widow now. I think that's certain. Joseph is gone somewhere between the time Jesus was 12 and the time he began his ministry. Joseph seems to have dropped off the scene. The Bible don't say much. It seems like, I, and I don't mean this to me, but it seems like when God gets done with you, he's done. He's just done. You know, Moses is gone. Let's go, Josh. Uh, Joseph who? Oh, yeah, yeah. They want to taught you how to work wood. He's gone. She's older now. Her shoulders are stooped a little bit. And there, a few silver threads among the gold. Those carefree days of youth are gone. She stands at the cross with the two other women and her son, John. And on the cross, her firstborn son. She watched as they beat him. 
She heard with the ear of a mother the screams, the cries of agony as she watched her son being tortured to death. She couldn't lift a finger to help him. She heard the swear words of the crowd, the lies that she could confound back, the blasphemy. She watched as they walked by and slapped him and beat him and cursed him, and she could do nothing about it. And then Jesus gave his last will and testament. Only those who have watched a loved one pass could even begin to understand what it means for Mary to be at the cross that day. As the hours pass and the agony increases, she looks at her son, just a shell of a man he used to be, beaten almost beyond recognition, rhythm in pain, and the crowd loving it. And in those hours, suddenly the cry comes from the cross. Jesus, looking down, sees his mother Mary and sees John standing next to her and cries out from the cross as he said, Dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, the scripture said the disciple took him into his home. We wouldn't understand the first reading of the significance of those words, but in Jewish thought, the instructions of a dying man were the most important. He could either write it down or say it, but whenever he said it, those were the most important words he will ever say. And when he said that at the end, he is literally giving mom, a, a, it's a, like a document, if you would. He is saying something, this is, this is going to happen. You're going to take care of her. Mom, there's nothing else I can do for you. They've got me pinned here. You see, John, John will be as you, uh, to you as I was with you. He'll be your son. You need John. Do you see my mom take care of her after I'm gone? Do for her what I would do if I were still alive. A dying request of the son. He was a Jew raised and under the law, and he knew these words. Honor your father and your mother, and you'll live long. That was that didn't even have to be biblically stated in our home. If I didn't honor my mama, my daddy would make sure I didn't live long. <laughs> I found out later in life those were scriptures. But before then, I, I, I didn't know it. I draw from this several things. I draw from the simple story three applications. No one is ever discharged from the sacred obligation of honor. If our Lord Jesus hanging on in agony remembered his mother at the very end of his life, then so should we. No one here is ever discharged from that sacred obligation. When you can't do anything else for the people you love, you can at least tell them, I love you. That's what Jesus was saying on the cross. Mom, I can't come down, but I love you. Number three, no matter what you do in this life, you can hardly be considered a success. If your rapid climb to the top, you ne neglect to care for your parents. If we spend time with them now, they'll spend time with us when we get older. Worse than an unbeliever, the scripture says. Worse than an unbeliever. It's to honor your father and your mother. Oh, children, obey your parents. There's never a time when it's, when it's okay not to honor your parents. Honor always. Don't, well, you don't ever use the, the great ceiling of your calling and where you're at in life and how busy you are. Amen. If Jesus being beaten and bruised and bloody had time to talk to his mama, we got time. If you really want to take the word to heart, go to your parents and tell them you love them. You have to while you got a chance. And if you can't honor them while they're alive you can remember them after they've gone you got to keep honoring them you got to stay after well you say pastor I, I the truth of the matter is i never I, my mom and dad if you only knew that i hated them this that and the other hear me again if you can't say anything good don't say anything just don't run them down just keep the idea of honor. Because I'm telling you, whatever you sow in life, you're going to reap it. If you're unable to speak good about your parents, you can honor them by refusing to speak evil of them. Perhaps your parents were not the best. And I, I know many of your stories, and I know where they're not so good. Uh, you know, and here's the, here's the thing. The older I get, the more I have chosen to see the good side of my parents. I can go back and show you the bad side. I can tell you the drunken fits and the switches and the beatings and all of these things that I, I, I believe that were out of sorts. I can tell you about all that, but that doesn't honor them. Honor. Now, a flip-flop across the kitchen, that was normal. <laughs> Amen. I deserve that. <laughs> all mom was doing was honing my reflexes. <laughs> Come on up here, Ramirez. Amen. You can forgive them and refuse to speak evil. Where's the gospel in a message like this? Friends, this is the gospel. Jesus said this when he was hanging on the cross. He said these words hours before he died. This is the gospel. Jesus died as he had lived, thinking of others. He never backed off and just thought, oh, I'm hurting. this." You know, it's one of the first things to come out of our mouth. It's about us. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. Today, you'll be with me in paradise. Son, behold your mom. Mom, 
Behold your son. Stand with me. Final words of a family man. You know what you're going to do today? If your parents are already gone, you're going to think about them. And you're going to give them some love. You ain't got to wait till next week. Second, if they're alive and you can, give them a call. Send them a text. I call. I have several men and women in this church that I call mom and dad. They like moms and dads to me. Then my mom, you know, to honor her. And, and, I, and, and then here's the other thing. Sometimes you've got to defend your family with the other siblings. Sometimes the other siblings just don't get it. They don't have the grace that you have, or maybe they've not ex- received the forgiveness you have. But I want to tell you, I don't care what the other siblings do, you honor. You obey the best you can. I found out in life, I, I'm, we don't always obey, but we can always honor. We don't always do the right thing, but I can always honor. Amen. I thank God for Mama. Woo, Mama. See, I, I go home and I say, Mama, make me some biscuits. Make me some gravy. You know what she'll do? She'll look at her daughter-in-law and say, make Jerry some biscuits. <laughs> yeah. She'll look at her granddaughter and say, make Jerry some biscuits. You, you know what? Mama, I ain't making biscuits no more. I don't make them biscuits. I don't fry that chicken like I used to. I don't do it. But I taught the other girls how to do it. Amen. And that, that, they'll do that for you. Pass it on down. Amen. All those things that you've got. Heads bowed, eyes closed for a moment. Those watching online, thank you. Listen to me. You ain't never going to go wrong honoring your parents. Doing the right thing. The scripture says you're going to live long in this life. You're going to get a life. There's nothing like for me to get to do a memorial service for somebody who I know everybody in that room honored that person. Oh, that's so easy to deal with. And it starts with us today. And even if the parents said, why would you call? I've been this to you. I've been mean to you. Yeah, but I believe the word says for me to forgive, to release and let it go. You may not even need to say that. You just may say, I just want to tell you I love you. You know, there were things you did for me. I thank you for bringing me into this life. I thank you for giving me up for adoption. I thank you for loving me like you have. I thank you for putting up with daddy the way you did all them years. I love you, mama. I love you. If you say, Pastor, I've been away from God. Can I just pray for you real quick? Because I don't know everybody in this room. If you've been away from him, put your hand up and back down real quick. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. That's three or four hands. That's what I felt this morning. Let's pray this with those hands lifted. Lord Jesus, wash over me with your blood. Forgive me my sins. Place my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. I give you thanks for my parents the guardians, the people that looked after me, all those I learned from. Help me to reciprocate it and pass it on. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, bless the Lord in here. Amen. You know what? I read to you out of Ecclesiastes. It said, honor your creator. Honor your creator. I had a moment just a couple of hours this week where I got caught up watching Nat Geo, I think it's what it's called, National Geographic. And I was watching New Zealand. Now there's another country I want to go to. I'm watching that and I'm going, I'm having a spiritual moment here because I'm realizing my creator created that. My creator set that in motion. My creator is is so illustrative in all of creation and everything that he does and I'm just sitting and I'm looking I'm going I, I honor my creator his name is Jesus amen have no problem with that but the father the son the holy ghost however you want to do it but I can tell you all them other people all them other gods I heard about they didn't do that my creator did that and when you understand what the creator does it should give the creation a a desire to worship 
I just wanted to worship him. I thank you for the horse and the dog. I thank you for what's under the sea and the air. I just begin to thank him. It just began to go all over me. He is so good. I want to live a little longer, don't you? To enjoy a little bit more in life. Amen. I want to get a little bit more out of life. The days are coming. Dennis, turn your head that way. There's a little gray popping up in your hair right there that was not there years ago. When we, oh, I see it on the other side too. You got matching grays. <laughs> Mine don't even match anymore. Mine's connected. Uh, that's funny. Amen. Life is moving on, my friend. Let's get hold of it. Win people to Jesus. Can I get an amen? amen. Hallelujah. Amen. God bless you. you. May be seated. Our service.